Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. The new wave movement of the late 70s and 80s is one of the most unique moments in the history of popular music. Aided by new technologies, bands like the B-52s and the Talking Heads were doing some shockingly experimental stuff, but few new wave bands pushed the envelope quite as far as Blondie. While they have a whole host of hits to choose from, what I find fascinating about Blondie is the way they write love songs like One Way or Another or the one this video is about, Call Me. You see, despite being written and sung by a woman, Debbie Harry, both songs are actually based on her interpretation of a male perspective. Call Me was written as the theme song for American Gigolo, a film about a male prostitute, while One Way or Another is based on a real ex-boyfriend of Harry's who stalked her after they broke up, so if you ever thought that song was creepy you were right. Anyway, this shift in perspective has a profound impact on how the music interprets love. In pop, love tends to be something beautiful, fun, and rewarding, but in Blondie songs, it's dark, obsessive, almost predatory. And that comes across not just in the lyrics, but in the music itself. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. And honestly, I don't think the chords are that important here. I know just saying that is gonna get me in a lot of trouble with certain corners of the musical internet, but hear me out. I'm not saying the chords aren't doing anything. Here we've got four flat three one, which is a classic blues riff. Then here we go back up to the flat three, then down to flat seven, which resolves to one in what's called a backdoor resolution. These are pretty iconic techniques and they give this intro an easily digestible sound, but check this out. <laughs> It's a completely different progression, but to Myers at least, it still basically reads as the intro to Call Me. I'm not sure I'd notice the chords were different at all if I hadn't been the one who changed them. And this isn't to say they could have been any chords, it's not hard to find progressions that don't work. <laughs> But we have quite a bit of flexibility without losing the central, recognizable sound of the section because that sound has very little to do with the harmony. This intro is all about the rhythm. This breaks up into three layers. The first is the basic shuffle groove laid down by the drums. A shuffle is a pretty simple concept. Basically, you have four beats per bar like normal, but instead of breaking those beats up into two eighth notes, you split them into three evenly spaced attacks instead, usually with an emphasis on the first and third. It's kind of like swing, but a bit more clearly defined. Shuffle grooves get used a lot in rock party music. They have a sense of freedom and debauchery to them compared to the more straight-laced 4-4. The shuffle groove here makes this song feel like an event, which gets punctuated at the end of every other bar with these two strong accented stabs. This is the only time we leave D minor, and moving to new chords helps further emphasize these two attacks, although again, it's not that important what those new chords are. The other two layers come from the guitars. Let's start with the high part. Here, the goal is simple. Reinforce the shuffle pattern the drums are laying down. It does this in a couple ways. First, each of these figures includes two attacks on the first and third triplets of the beat, adding some additional bounciness. Also, it shows up on beats two and four of each bar. This is called the backbeat, and in a normal rock groove, it's where the snare goes, so it's a great place to put other accented parts as well. Leaning on the backbeat like this gives the song a cool, casual vibe as opposed to the more in-your-face attitude of the downbeat. The final layer comes in halfway through the intro. <laughs> We're still emphasizing the shuffle groove with the same rhythm on the backbeat, but now the downbeats are interesting too. Here they're playing all three triplets, but the first one, placed right on the most important beat, isn't actually the right chord. This is a pretty common sound in punk music, where instead of just starting on your target, you start a whole step below it, then quickly move up. It gives you a sort of precise practice sloppiness that makes the music feel like it's kinda stumbling, but in a way that's still totally controlled. Having a C chord here is a bit jarring, but it goes by so fast that really it just sort of blends in with the overall harmony. You don't consciously feel like it's a different chord at all. It sounds more like a drunk version of the target D. Taken together, these three parts combine to make this intro instantly recognizable even without any harmonic information, which is why I was able to completely change the chord progression without really losing its essence. And to be clear, the revelation here isn't just that they used a shuffle groove. Shuffles have been around for a long time. No, my point is that the way they play around with that rhythm, with the high stabs, the drunken downbeats, and these two big attacks at the end of the pattern, can be just as unique as any chord progression. This leads into the verse... And while I do want to talk about the chords here, I'm gonna start with a melody. It's moving exclusively by step, which tends to sound more conversational than a bunch of leaps. For example, Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is almost entirely stepwise motion. But here, that's not the vibe I'm getting for a couple reasons. The first is, again, the rhythm. Notice how after the first one, all the notes are positioned on consecutive upbeats, making the whole line feel incredibly syncopated. Syncopation often makes melodies feel looser and more natural, but when it's this relentless and rigid, 
not so much. Instead, it feels poised, deliberate, like every syllable is being harshly enunciated at you. And that effect is amplified by the shape of the melody. Sure, it's moving by steps, but those steps don't feel very natural either. We start on the root, march straight up to the fifth, then right back down, after which we do the whole thing again, but smaller. It's the sort of melody you might expect to get if you told a robot that stepwise motion was good, but didn't bother explaining why. It lacks any nuance, which actually hold up. I'm worried that what you just heard was me saying this melody was bad. I didn't say that. I think it's exactly the right melody for this song. Some songs need subtlety, but Call Me isn't one of them. The rigid rise and fall of this line gives the verse a rote, mechanical feel, making it seem less like a plea for love and more like an advertisement. It's a sarcastic, cynical look at human emotion told through a complete lack of melodic nuance. That's amazing. But okay, we've put it off long enough, let's talk chords. This section is basically a shuttle between D minor, the one chord and B flat major, the flat six. These are the two most stable chords in the key, and we spend a full two bars on each of them, so there's really not a lot of harmonic motion here. The chords are staying out of the way so the melody can do its job. That all changes in the pre chorus, though. <laughs> In fact, a lot of things change here, most notably the length. Whereas the verse was built on four-bar phrases, the pre-chorus is only two. This acceleration creates the sense that we're building towards something, which is echoed in the melody where instead of walking up to the fifth and then back down, we just walk up to the fifth and stay there. It's a fairly straightforward development of the previous melodic idea, just chopping off the second half and leaving us hanging on an unresolved note. The harmony also joins in with our first truly unstable chords, the four and the five. This is, again, a pretty standard harmonic idea. The four takes you away from the root and the five points you back. It's the same sort of musical language you might expect to find in a Mozart piece, but here there's a couple twists. For starters, they play the shuttle twice, so instead of pointing to one, the first five chord just goes back to four to really build up anticipation for the ultimate resolution. But more importantly, they're both major. Using a major five chord in minor is pretty common, so I won't spend too much time on that, but the four chord is typically still minor. What's happening? Well, there's a couple ways to explain this. The first is as a product of blues harmony. In the blues, it's not uncommon to harmonize all your chords as major regardless of the key, and if we look through this song, that's basically what we're doing with one exception. All the D chords are still minor. There's something kind of poetic about everything being major except the one chord, so the only dark, sad place is our harmonic home. Draw whatever metaphors you want from that. The more classical way to look at it, though, is as what's called modal interchange, which is where you borrow a chord from a neighboring scale. We're in D minor, and this G chord exists in D major, which is close enough. Modal interchange adds a bit more character and complexity, giving you access to more emotional colors, and we can divide it further into two categories, contradictive and hidden. Hidden interchange is where the chord you're using may not fit in the key, but it still works with the chords before and after it. Like in the intro, we had D minor, G major, F major. That G major includes a B natural, which isn't in the key, but neither F major nor D minor has any kind of B in it, so you don't really notice the issue. It just sounds like a brighter four chord. In the pre-chorus, on the other hand, our G G major is coming directly after the verse is B flat major, which, as you might imagine, contains a B flat. This creates a contradiction that makes the borrowing stand out a lot more. It more clearly violates your expectations, making it feel less bright and more aggressive, and Harry makes sure to lean on another B flat in the melody over the A chord, so we still get that same sense of contradiction the second time through. Next comes the chorus. where the melody switches to just walking down a minor pentatonic scale. This has a wider range and more leaps than the verse, but to me it still feels more natural because the shape is less geometric. On chords, the thing that stands out most to me here is that the harmonic motion is pretty weak. We've got root motion of a third here, here, and here. There's that same contradictive interchange again, with G major going to B flat, but while that creates a clash, it doesn't really give you any resolution. The only place we see that is from F to G, which arrives by step, but for the most part, we're not really going much of anywhere. Why not? Well, it's right there in the lyrics. You can call me any time. This isn't a moment of action. There's no journey. The narrator is sitting by the phone waiting for their love to call. It's a passive progression for a passive story. Moving on, after the second chorus, we get this. <laughs> which is what's called a direct modulation, or less formally, a truck driver's key change. This is where you just take the thing you were already playing and start playing it in a different, usually slightly higher key. It's a great way to get a quick shot of energy, and it lifts the song up into the bridge. It's especially cool here because that slurred downbeat means that for a split second, the guitar is still playing D, so it feels like we slide into the new key instead of just skipping to it. Then we get the bridge. <laughs> Thank you.
where we see a similar two chord shuttle to the verse, but in a new key. Here though, instead of going between one and flat six, which are both stable, the second chord is five minor. This is an unusual sound. Even in minor, we're used to the five chord being major, but here it doesn't really do much to point back to the root, it just adds instability, kind of like the four chord would. This is also the only time we hear a minor chord that isn't the root, which makes this the creepiest part. Coupled with the return to a strict formulaic structure in the melody, it feels almost like a siren song trying to lure you into temptation. From there we get another direct modulation. <laughs> with a couple interesting twists. First of all, the chords are major now, lifting us up, although that effect is somewhat belied by the half-step motion. Direct modulations usually go up a whole step because it's more consonant. The half-step is one of the gnarliest intervals in standard tuning, so even though we're in major now, that F hangs over the E from the previous key in a slightly uncomfortable way. We're not out of the woods yet. The other cool part here is that even though the chords went up, the melody actually shifted down. In the first half, the first bar was an arpeggio from B down to E, whereas here we've got A down to C. This helps counterbalance the triumphant sound of the harmonic rise to keep things feeling nice and sinister. After that, we get the end of the bridge. Which, hold on, that's the verse progression, or the combined verse pre-chorus progression, but point is, we've already heard this. And not like a modulated version, this is right back in our original key of D minor, but how? Well, the trick comes from that last modulation. We called this the 1 and 5 in F major, but if we think back to the intro, these two chords might look familiar. F, C, D minor was the second chord fill there. Remember the thing about backdoor resolutions? Yeah, both these chords exist in D minor, so they can serve as pivots to help transition us back to that key without being obvious about it. But why bother? Well, using the same chord progression in a different structural context with a new rhythm and a new melody gives the song a sense of continuity. The bridge was a big musical departure, so bringing back something from earlier helps prevent it from seeming like a completely unrelated piece that just got, like, grafted on. And that's basically it. We get a synth solo over the whole bridge section, then use our sneaky pivot modulation to return to the chorus in our original key, which we just repeat while Harry ad-libs until the song fades out. Or at least that's the single version. The actual theme in American Gigolo is eight minutes long, featuring another verse, extended sections, and even a few new ones, but since I was born almost a decade after that movie came out, the single is the one I know. If you're curious though, I'll link to the full version in the description. It's pretty cool. Anyway, thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.